going through slides. And that way you might, you can follow me in each step. And so it'll, I'm, I'm hoping that increase the, uh, the uh, learning aspect of this. For, for the packages, as you know, uh, there are two main packages that will be discussed today, Pandas and Matplotlib. NumPy is something that is usually used, uh, like it's the first package that everyone installs when you're using Python. Second image, I'm just using it to load some data sets, some images just to show some examples. And C bones is only being used once. So even if you don't have it installed, that should be fine. So let's let's start with Panda. What, what, what is Panda? Panda stands for Python Data Analysis Library. And it is a sort of designed to enable an easy way for Python users, Python programmers to be able to manage, analyze, and wrangle their data, especially data firms, some things that you usually uh, face in uh, R rather than in Python, things that you could show as tables or work with things like SQL, that sort of thing. You can use Panda with a lot of different uh, formats, or you could use pandas to load uh, your files with different formats that could be uh, text file, CCSV file, or uh, it could be a remote server and you just load your SQL database or Postgres database. It is designed to be very user friendly, both local and um, for remote access. Um, so uh, let's get some very small data set, I guess. So this is where the Seaborn comes handy. I'm just using their data set uh, here too, which lists uh, first in order to see what databases or data sets are available. Can you zoom in a little bit, Arden? Much better, thank you. To see the uh, available data sets, Seaborn uh, has a bunch. You could use your own, but uh, today I'm going with the available ones so that everyone can have access to. It's called get data set names. And you see there it has a bunch of data set that we could uh, uh, download and use. So let's get the car crash, for example, data set, which is that I can actually copy this from my own not so that you would have it here. See, so by simply just load data set, we can get that car crash data set. And then, so here Panda comes in. This uh, data set that we have is already uh, in Panda's format. And so if you just type its name and enter, you see, you can see all the data, which the first column is the indexes, indices, and uh, different columns that represent different data. In this case, the uh, effect of a spinning. So, sorry. Uh, fair spinning on uh, car crashes and um, no previous uh, crashes before that and, and those sort of current thing. So, but sometimes this data set is not that long. It's only 50 rows or 51 rows, but sometimes this could be thousands of rows. And so you don't want it you know, completely uh, crash your system just because you want to show one system, uh, one table. So instead, some of the things that Panda offers are head and tail, which for head, if you use that, you could just simply look at the few lines, few first rows. Let's say we just want to look at the first four rows. We do that head and four, and we, we, can, we only see uh, that one. Or we could look at the end of the data set to using tail, which is, is exactly the same. And now we'll see the last four rows here. Um, the other uh, things that pandas, I, I'm, uh, I won't give you much more of uh, like background and history and those kind of things. Uh, I figured because it's a workshop, if you just go through examples, that might be more beneficial. So I'll just go through different examples. 
because I'm, I, I know that that would be more beneficial for me if I wanted to learn. I hope that that would be the same for you guys. So this is for VU. Now let's say you want to uh, perform some statistical analysis. You want to get the average or the standard deviation, median, all, all those kind of things. The, one of the very nice benefits of pandas is that if let's say you wanted to use NumPy, in order to use NumPy, you first need to get this column as, which in this case, for example, I can get that own column and to NumPy. And then now that I have my NumPy, I can again use uh, NumPy to measure uh, average or standard deviation or median or everything you want. But we don't need to. And that makes it easier for us by having those capabilities built in. So for example, we want to get the average. We just do this column for the car crash, which you could either use it this way, like the classes, or you could look at uh, use it like a dictionary. Either way, it'll work. And then you could just simply say that mean will give you the average or some give you the uh, sum. Or let's say you wanted to get the quantile, uh, which in that case, you also have the quantile. Let's say you want to get the first 25 person quantile. And uh, it has multiple different things. Uh, just to save time, I'm copying from the old notes. Uh, some of the uh, ones that I brought here, and there, there are more, are just average uh, standard deviation, some count, which shows number of uh, values you have or number of uh, elements in, the, in that series or in that column, and then a bunch of more. And then as you see again, instead of just, so uh, this stats that I created is a dictionary. And so if I wanted to just show that dictionary, it would be something like this. But I want to use Panda to make it look more appealing and easier to follow. So instead, I just do PD, which if you recall, it was we import Pandas as PD to make it easier for cleanliness sake. And so you just say PD that data frame. This data frame input as I mentioned, could be, uh, and it could be a dictionary, could be a list, could be a multiple list, which I'll go through all of them. And one by one show how you, we can do that. But for just to show here what it is, we have a dictionary, we simply just uh, give that dictionary and then enter. And then, uh, well, in, in this case, we need to specify index because we only have one row. If we didn't, we had more than one row, then you didn't even need to uh, specify the index too. This is one of the pandas bug that I'm not sure why there is, it only happens when you only have one row. And uh, this is your values, all the things that you were looking for. And let's say you wanna transpose this, you can again simply just say dot T and it transposed the data for you. Everything try to be, be as simple as possible. Can you, since this was code that wasn't on the HackMD, can you paste this um, this stats kind of array that you made in the chat so we can all grab it? Yeah, thank you. This one. Uh, I don't uh, think we can type that fast. Yeah, just this one. This dictionary. Should I put it in the uh, HackMD or that could be nice. Either that or the chat. I just want to play with it myself. <laughs> And then this says, Thank I you, put it under live code. And then I guess I can add the packages there too. So now, now let's go to another data set. Uh, that would be more appropriate for the following examples. Let's say we wanna get a data set for the flights. It 
again, we only want to see the first five rows to make sure we're, we're not, we don't crash our system. So this the flight data set has some indexes, indices, which usually is just a, a range of numbers from zero starting to the end, but doesn't have to be. You could specify any of this column as your index, which I'll show later on. And there are two columns, year, month, and number of passengers with, you know, with respect to those year and month. So let's try to, now let's say you, instead of this um, integer numbers, you want your year to be the index instead. In order to do that, again, you just take your Panda data frame and type that set index. And then name of the, uh, you can either add a column here as a list or any other type of array, or you could just uh, type the name of the column. Let's say we want to make it to be year, and then enter. And as, as you can see now, the indices are the year, and then you only have two columns. Let's do head two so that we can make it easier for them. I'm, I'm I'm doing the diamond here instead of flight because I, I I need some of the columns to be string so that I can show you how we can play with the strings. In this case, I loaded the diamond data set and set the column cut for the indices. For example, the first row is the cut was ideal and was 23 carat and so on and so on. So now let's say you, you have the state of frame. You don't want to go obviously manually count it. You want to uh, check the type first and foremost, which is obvious is pandas, and also the size. For, for type, you could just simply type type in Python. It should give you the type. I think this should also give you the type. Let's check to make sure it does or not. Okay, no, you, you, you could use the, the Python mental built-in type function. And for the size, you could either do that shape. Again, like the Panda has a lot of features from NumPy and Matplotlib built-in, which is why it makes it much nicer and easier. You don't have to uh, convert this uh, column data frame into NumPy array and then use NumPy or Matplotlib for visualization. For example, instead of NumPy.shape, I can just do data frame that shape and get the shape. Or I could do that size, which will only give us the number of rows. It won't give us, uh, if we do shape, you know, we have 53, around 54,000 rows and 10 columns, which three, six, nine, and then, well, we used to, uh, this is because we haven't kind of said it. If you, the diamond equal to, and then in that case, uh, we would have the new data frame with the new index, which we didn't want to at this, at this point. Data extraction. Now, so we have this data, this is actually, and let me, this is the data set that right now we are working on. Uh, we haven't changed the index yet. This is the original one. Let's say you want to extract only the samples that the cut is ideal, for example, or color is a certain thing. Instead of writing for loops and using find or where function in NumPy and those kind of things, you could just simply say diamonds either equal to, I sorry, diamonds that cut in this case to get this series. Each column in a data frame is called series and equal to ideal. Or if you wanted to get the whole data and all the information for columns for the samples that the cut is ideal, you could instead work again like a NumPy array. You say diamonds, show me the diamonds that 
only where diamonds that cut are um, uh, series is equal to ideal. Again, this that could also be uh, in a dictionary style or in a class style. This seems nicer to me. That's why I usually use that. And then type enter. I, so this is for good. I'm not sure why for ideal didn't work. For premium also, see you get all the rows and the indices. For example, the index one, which is the second row in Python, third and 12 and so on. These were all the ones, the diamonds that had the premium cut. And then if you wanted to count the number of these, you could either, this could be a new data frame, by the way. And so you, you could either use count or shape. And then as you can see, before we had about 54,000 overall diamonds, but only 13.7 thousand of them had premium cut. Kelsey, let me know if you wanted me to copy any of these two. I think it's okay as long as people are keeping up. Um, but I guess if anybody has questions or wants something pasted, just speak up, please. Yeah. And I, I, as you can see, I'm writing the code first just to show you how it works and then just copy paste a clean version of it so that you could see it uh, easier. Uh, this is like the exact same thing that I wrote only we have print function, which is number of diamonds with good cut are 4,906 out of the 54,000 that we had. And this is the table for it, for only the first five. If you don't specify a number in the head, it will by default will be five, unless you change it. Um, so um, let's say now you want it, it, take get the index from this or the columns from this. In order to do that, again, this, this is our new data frame. As you can see, I, I've named it diamonds cut good equal to diamonds only where the cut was good. So this is our new data frame. If I simply type that data frame, that index, it will give me the list of all the indices that the diamond had the good cut. Or if I type columns, it'll give me the list of columns, which was carrot cut colors and so on. This, you, you, again, you could use Python functions. You could change this to a list or NumPy array. And I haven't tried dictionary. Let's see if that would work too. It didn't. Usually people go with list, but if you wanted to. This also becomes handy when you have a data CSV file for a data, huge data set that you're trying to analyze. You don't know what are the columns. Maybe there are hundreds of columns and you're looking for a specific column or a specific row. All you need to do is just simply type uh, that the name of the column in this case. If there was a space, let's say instead of clarity was clarity a space something else, then obviously you can't use dot clarity. You have to use the dictionary style in order to be able to specify the space there. Then for, for the index, if we, let's say, if you wanted to look at the index for the original data frame, which had the normal zero, one, two, up to 54,000. If you look at the index, you see instead of numbers, it has just a range index which is similar to similar to range in Python, which in this case would be a range of zero and five, three, nine, four, zero. In order to make it easier to understand, this is how it specifies it. The other thing that we could do is to slice the data frame. Let's say you have this in a table, you wanna divide it into train and test. You want to get the first 80% for your training, then uh, follow the, the rest 
for uh, validation or for test. All you need to do is to first get the size, which is um, or the, the number of rows in this case. And then in order to slice this data frame, so let's let's assume the cut threshold is 80%, 80 percent, eighty percent of our our threshold is eighty percent of whatever the size is. We want to see the we want to see the limit for 80, the first eighty percent of the data, which is forty two thousand or four hundred thirty one thousand. Oh, so uh, I, I I need to I, when you say uh, when you use size, it doesn't. I mean, let's say it doesn't show the number of rows. It shows the number of va values, elements, or cells that you have. So in this case, it will be number of rows multiplied by number of colors. So in order to get the number of rows, we could instead use the shape and then the the first element, which is. And then our threshold would be 42,000. Now we want to get the first 42,000. All we need to do for this data frame is to use either that iLock, which looks for indices that you specify. Let's say you say 10 to 15. Or you could do lock, which uh, you can specify both the indices and column, uh, let's say 10 up to 15, and depth column and table column. Let's make sure this works. See, I, I, only, you know, I only needed the depth and table for these indices and as simple as that. If I would have gone with iLock, it, will show me all the tables. And then after that, you could again use, I only want to see the colors. So this is a color. Or if I want to see both depths and table. Oh, so it needs to be in sort of a double, double list. This is the tricky part. You could either do an string here for the name of the column, or you need to be inside the list if you have multiple column lists. For, for the 80%, you, we could just simply say, do this, and then you have your 80%. Can you explain the difference between lock and iLock again? Uh, I, I lock is for just indices. For example, this zero, one, two, three. Let's say you want to get the index five through index ten. You say go through five until ten, till ten, and only show me those rows, which is five through ten, and then it will show you all the columns for those five, six, seven, eight, nine rows. But if you use lock, you can you specify indices, but also you need to specify the column. Let's say you want to go with cut again. You want to get the five, six, seven, eight, nine for the cut column. We use lock and then. <coughs> this, I, I should have shown this before, but I wanted to get a grasp of what, are, what, are the, what I mean by statistical information. Uh, Panda has both info and describe which gives you some information there. So this was our original uh, data table. If we type data frame 
uh, described, it will give us only for the numerical columns. As you can see, you can't find cut here because it was a string. But for the numerical ones, it gives you a mean average standard deviation minimum from different quantiles and so on for each of the numerical columns. Or if you use info, it'll show you for each column, type of that column, which in that case for cut was categorical. You only had a few specific options or that was allowed. Depths, what is a float 64 bit and, and, and so on and so on. And this number of null is because as you know, you uh, there it is it happens a lot when your let's say CSV file has a lot of empty cells, which when you load it using panel data frame, those empty cells will uh, be shown as numpy dot null as null or numpy dot nan. And in that case, if we had any none here, then the number of non null counted would be different. But because we don't all columns have the same number of uh, cells, meaningful cells. The uh, other uh, capability, now let's say you want to broadcast. And what, what I mean by broadcast, let's say you want to change the, uh, uh, somebody prepared this data frame, but they made a mistake. The carrot should have been uh, uh, smaller than what it is specified this by 0.4, let's say. You, if you wanted to uh, reduce or decrease all these carrots by 0.5, or to make it easier, let's go by the only first five rows. You, uh, there was a mistake. You will need to change the carrots all and specify them either to a specific number or just uh, uh, set them as null because you're not sure what the exact carrot was uh, and in turn made a mistake, let's say. In order to broadcast, you don't need to specify the same, same list size list. You can, but you don't need to. You can just specify a specific number. So in that case, uh, let's say we use the lock again. We say for the uh, rows one to five and cut, put all of those cut to null because we made a mistake. We're not sure if those values are correct. It's an answer. And so now you can see these change to none. And then later on, you can, and then this could be anything else, or it could be wrong. I, I'm not sure if that would work though, because the format is, yeah, because the full column format is specified to float, you can't specify a string, but you could specify other numbers. I think because we, oh, interesting. I'm not sure why it's happening. And it, and because it was already set to none, it, it didn't allow me to change it, which is a bug, obviously, you shouldn't have. In this case, this is a very good practice to always create a new variable to make sure you're not changing the original ones. Uh, yeah, you already saw this. When we specify the type push column, in this case, cut was string, carrot was float, uh, or cut was a categorical string. In, in those cases, if you try to add a value that doesn't belong to this list or types of cut, mi minus the none, obviously, it will give us an error. So in this case, if I wanted to change the cut for the same thing that happened here, I, I won't need to do it again. If I wanted to change this to something, something, it, will, it shouldn't do it because it's not part of the, the categorical options that was part of it. But if I wanted to change it to diamond, it, well, ideally it worked because it was part of the, uh, part of the list of the options that you, you 
use for, for cut. No, uh, let's say we want to see what are those uh, types. You you never work with diamonds. You don't know what are these, what are they all good. You just want to know what are the different types so that you could work with those. In, in, in those cases, uh, you could use, you know, so NumPy has a function called NumPy that unique. The Panda also has that. You could simply say uh, diamonds for the cut column show me the, all the unique values, which in that case you see is ideal, NAND, which we added, very good, fair, good, and premium. And then again, if you want to have it as a list or NumPy array, you could just, and you have all your categories here. Uh, if you wanted to, instead of, uh, Working with the, the pandas, if you wanted to work with NumPy arrays, all you need to do is to use that values, which you could either get it for all your columns, which in this case, we have, you see, uh, we have an array with the same size with different values, or you could just take one specific column and or let's do something that has, let's go with carrot. And, and this is a NumPy array, as you can see, it's a type of NumPy array. And then you could do everything with this that you would usually do with NumPy array. And is my pace okay? Anyone has any questions or should I just continue with the same pace? I think so. I think the only struggle I have is when you type something and then you erase it and type something else. It would be nice if it was like the next line so I could catch up if I'm behind. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I mean, I, no, if no, we I, get to complain. <laughs> I, I made site errors that last one, but yeah, I'll, I'll try not to do that. So the, this copy paste is the same thing that I did. I took these three columns, which is cut and clarity, and the values because I want to have a NumPy array which has only those three columns and I call it data. And then as you can see, type of data is NumPy array and data that shape is 53940 by three. <coughs> uh, so we saw how data frame works. But now let's create our own data frame. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned that this could be accomplished through different ways. You could uh, have a CSV file that you either prepared or uh, obtained from somewhere else, or it could be a list, or it could be a dictionary that you create inside your script or Jupyter notebook and then use panda that data frame to convert that to a data frame. So let, let's go with the CSV for the first try. I already have the CSV file here. I've called it response probabilities, which is a CSV for one of my own uh, works, my own uh, grad school work. And now I want to import that CSV file in uh, pandas type format. I can just say df. Usually uh, this is just a name, it's a variable. I call it data from df. And then pd, which stands for the pandas dot read CS. You see, there's a lot of options. You could read the clipboard, whatever you have copied in your clipboard, or it could be CSV, Excel, or any of HDF, JSON, it has a lot of different options or SQL as I mentioned. Uh, we right now have a CSV file. So we just PDR CSV and then the address for that CSV, which in this case, for me, it's here. It's the same directory. I don't need to specify 
Well, I can't specify the absolute path, but I don't need to because it's the same directory. And this is the table. For example, this is for a checks X-ray classification to a pathologist. Uh, each of these colors are different pathology, lung opacity, edema, pneumonia, and so on, so on. As you can see, my the index column didn't have a very, it had the index column and it was called unnamed or it didn't have a name and it's changed it to unnamed. But I don't want to see that. I, want it, I don't want to have two different indexes here. So all I need to do again is just to df.setIndex and then just name whatever it is. Or I could drop that too. Either way would work. See, I, I changed that to index. Or I could just completely drop that column. Uh, this was from CSV, which, uh, uh, let me open the CSV for you to see too. Uh, this is my CSV file, the original CSV file, which the first row has my you know, columns, column names, and then the following are the names. Now let's do from dictionary. We need to create our own dictionary. In this case, let's, the, the, let's so this is my dictionary. It's uh, my data uh, equal to apple, which is a list and peach and oranges. I want to convert that to a pile of data frame. Again, all I need to do is to do a data frame and, in, and just simply add data and it will automatically uh, convert it to a data frame. As you can see, it. oh, I have it here. It has a lot of other options. You could specify the index or column list, which in this case, because it was a dictionary, automatically detected the column list. If it was a NumPy array or list, it wouldn't be able to. Or we can specify the, the type, which in this case is integer, for example. Uh, and for indexes, uh, let's say this is my index. The first one is for picnic, the first row. The other one is for brunch. And then last one is for dinner. Oh. You see the first row picnic, brunch, dinner, you get to have one apple, no peach and two oranges. As simple as that. Uh, similarly for from a list is just as easy. The only difference is that you don't have the column names, you have to specify those. So th this is my list. I have an apple list, peach list and oranges. And then I have a columns list, which says each of these, what was the column name? And then I have an index list. So I can define data as a list of these lists. And then the Panda will automatically realize, recognize what I'm looking for. Again, I define my data frame as df equal to pd data frame. My data, which is the list of lists, which is these three fruits my list columns and my indices. Again, I get the same thing that I got here. Uh, as you can see, dictionary is always much easier and much more straightforward. You, you could do the like zip too, so that you would add the column and data together. I, 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 if you're not familiar with zip, zip is usually to create a generator from two same size list of NumPy array or same generator. In this case, I'm saying this columns and this data uh, load this together uh, in a generator and then convert that to a dictionary, which the result is like this, which is the same as what we have here. And then I can feed that to my uh, data frame. And so I don't need the column list anymore.
And see, it was the same, it's for similarity. This is again, the uh, same thing, just you, for the first one, is simply adding both column index for the second one is to use zip functionality to, to have both data and column in, in the same space. Uh, so we have this fruits for two different uh, events. Now let's say we want to add another fruit to our diet. We want to add a kiwi or whatever. All we need to do again is just simply to do, uh, if you remember this data frame, similar to NumPy, we could simply say DF peach and then it will show us the peach column and it goes for everything else. So let's say we want to have a key V. So all we need to do is to do DF key V equal to a NumPy array or list of the same size, same number of rows, or if you want to use broadcasting, just one number, whatever, whatever it wants to be, and then show the results. See, I had a key V one for all three events. Or instead of just broadcasting, I could do one, zero, two, for example. And then for picking, I get one KV, no, and two. And I'll upload this in Jupyter Notebook or provide the link. We will get this Jupyter Notebook to you guys in case you wanted to replicate these for yourself later on. Uh, just to show you another example for broadcasting, let's say this is my dictionary. I have apple, peach, oranges, which each of them has a list of size three, uh, but for month and year, there is only one value, one string. In this case, for May 2021, this is my diet. If I just feed that to Panadai data frame, it will automatically recognize that these three, you need to take the list values but for these two need to broadcast. And for the index, you usually have to add the index separately. That's the unfortunate part. And see, tada, I have it. I have these fruits, these diets for these uh, May 2021. So, the, uh, so, so far we went through uh, the tables, how to play with those uh, and those kind of things. But now we want to show the results uh, or visualize some of this information. Uh, as I said, we could use Matplotlib for a lot of these things, but Panda also has a lot of Matplotlib uh, functionalities built in, which uh, in, in that case, let's uh, get the, the CSV that we created here. Let's get it again. And so now I want to plot those, uh, those, those values. Or well, let's say I only want to plot the uh, first 100 rows. In that case, all I need to do is to use iLock again and do the first 100 rows. And well, well I can use Maplot. Let's, let's use Maplot first. Uh, if you remember at the top, we imported Maplot from the, the pipeline. This is what we imported at the top. So right now we have the plot. All you need to do is to do plot that plot, and then the first hundred rows for, for let's only do one, one column because it might be messy right now. And also they are like, or we could do the lock instead, as I mentioned before. And, and as you can see, I have uh, the changes for the cardiomegaly pathology for the first 100 patients. And then I, I, similar to Applied, I can specify my X label, for example, is 
uh, all I need to do is just to apply that X label and then my X label in this case uh, is just different patients, which, which we don't have a name. And for the Y label, it's the probabilities that that patient, that a specific uh, subject person has uh, cardiomegaly. And then see, oh, now we have the, the, the sort of label for, for our indices too. Uh, the, but uh, so this was using my plotlet. Now let's try plotting this directly. Uh, same uh, column and rows. This is what we had, what we separated. If you want to use them pandas directly, all we need to do is to just to do that plot. This, it has multiple different ways. You could either do your data frame dot plot, or you could use that plot or plot that plot, which I, I, I always use just in this one, this one, but I, I, I think I might show some examples for the other ones too. So, so in this case, let, let's see what we get here. See, so instead of using Matplotlib, we use the panda and get the same exact result. But uh, if I wanted, uh, so, let, let me show you the, the full example instead of typing out the whole thing. Let's work with the car crash data set again. And then I, I, I've written the, the same things that I explained. I've written in different ways. We could uh, either use Matplotlib or for a specific just uh, row indices or using power indexes. Which is this is both for Matplotlib. Now, if I wanted to use uh, pandas directly, uh, so you can ignore all of this. We can go through them one by one. Let's go with the first one. In the first method, we want to. So th this is our uh, car accident uh, data frame table results, right? Our indexes is just a bunch of numbers, might not mean anything but we have these values for different states, for Alabama, or Arizona, and so on. And so we want to study and look at this table and see how much the insurance premium changes based on the speedings for Arizona state, for example. And so in order to be able to use the Pandas plotting feature directly, we can specify the index in the data frame. And so Panda will automatically recognize what should be the X axis labels. And as you can see, similar to before, I'm using data frame that set index. And then I'm only taking one series or one column, no previous uh, incidents that those, this is the, Great on number of people who didn't have any pre previous uh, car accidents. And then again, I'm only I'm using MapLolib here. Well, I'll, I, the next one I think would be the Panda. I'm not sure why I keep using that, but it's the same thing. Oh, okay. Now I did. What happened there? So again, set the index and then did I jump something? I think I did. This is, uh, this is for the map problem. As you can see, I'm showing the no previous with that index. I'm using a map problem, which also automatically, you see, this isn't NumPy array, this is a pandas data frame. And it's only one column, but because it's pandas, it has the indexes built in. The good thing about separating different columns is that when you specify the index, each of those columns also has the index for themselves. Which, which when you use Matplotlib to plot those data, it will automatically recognize that X axis should be different states in this case. Or we could do this uh, manually. You could say, 
specify the roles at the F dot abbreviation, which is for the state. We could either do uh, a NumPy by using that values or just use the panda directly, map all it could work with both, and then same with that for the data, and then plot the rows and data, and then we get the same thing. Uh, so this, this was using Matplotlib, Matplotlib using Panda data frame, but we didn't need, we don't need to go there. We could just directly use Panda itself, which in this case, uh, again, set the index column. And so let, uh, for example, I want to plot these four columns, which is insurance losses, alcohol use, spinning, and no previous uh, incident of car accident. I want to plot all these four with respect to each state, which is my indices. So I, all I need to do is to do my data frame and then a list of names for my columns and then that plot. And then I'm showing the Y scale uh, in logarithmic. Log, I'm using logarithmic uh, scale because to make it easier to see the result. Oh, okay, and and so so the, the nice thing about this when we use uh, pan, uh, matplotlib, as you can see, we have to only work with one column here, and also it didn't have legend. We had to specify the index in order to get the index, which is fine, but we don't have any other information. But when we use pandas directly to plot those information, we could work with multiple uh, columns. It automatically generates the legend for us, uh, and also we I could do. So even though I use Panda to plot this data, but I use Matplotlib to set the y scale to logarithmic and it still worked because Panda uses Matplotlib built in. The, uh, so that was the first option. The, the second way that you could replicate this is that instead of using four different columns, you could do that individually. You want to plot this column, no previous incidents. You want to set the color to green, style as dot, and legend true. And if we wanted to use matplotlib again, we had to set plot that subplot, which I'll show later. But with Panda, we don't need to. All we need to do is just to set legend equal to true, and then the next one, and then next one, and next one. And it will automatically recognize that they're all part of the same uh, plot and we'll show all of them together. My Jupyter notebook is, a, this is the one of the downfalls of using Jupyter notebook, I guess, the one the server crashes. The, this is the result, as you can see, it's similar to when we use all of them together. And third option, which is, the, which is in case uh, we want to plot all the columns, although the, this one would only work if all the columns have numerical values, otherwise it wouldn't work. So I, I say, take the data frame, plot all the columns, only my indices or X axis is the state or abbreviation. This is all I need to do. And then if I, if I plot this, So you can see all I get all the, the to total number of accidents, speeding, alcohol, so on, so on for each state. Let me open this again to see if it'll fix it. Oh, because I close and open, I need to load my modules. Okay.
So this was plotted directly from pandas. Now, it's not just a simple plot. It has a lot of other capability, which is similar to plot. Let's say you want to plot them. You want to do a scatter plot, which is a very common thing that usually when you do some data analysis, you need that. Again, if uh, again, let's just to make sure we have it. We load our car crashes data frame or table. This time, let's set the index to speeding. And then we want to plot the insurance losses and set the Y label to insurance losses. As you can see, because both of them are numerical values and they're not really sorted, you get a very messed up plot. So in order to fix it, you could uh, just simply specify the kind, which is uh, scatter. So in, in this case, uh, instead of doing this, I could, or even, I don't even need this either. I could simply say df.plot as I showed before. I want my X axis to be speeding and my column or my Y axis would be insurance losses. And then this is where the scatter comes. All we need to do is to just simply add kind equal to scatter. Uh, just to make sure I don't have any. And so if I plot this now, so instead of that messed up plot, we plotted the, the scatter plot that I was looking for, for insurance loss. It said all the Y label, X has X label automatically and it worked very nicely. This data frame, by the way, is the whole, the full data frame. It's not all the rows and all the columns, but because I specified X and Y, it worked. The, the other one is box plot, which uh, let me go through these a little bit faster so that you're not getting bored. Again, the same data frame. Um, I want to show all these four columns. Kind instead of a scatter is box this time. Yeah, as you can see, it automatically label everything. And so the, the last thing for the plotting is uh, if you want to save your plots, which all you need to do after you did your visualization, whatever it is, all you need to do is to use again matplotlib that save fig, and then figure that JPG or PDF or PNG, and just run it again. See, figure that PNG character appeared. As simple as that. The, the other very common data analysis method is using histograms. Again, for histogram, you could either use pandas directly and for the kind instead of scatter or box, send, uh, use hest, or uh, you could use it directly by data frame dot hest, which both of them gives you similar result. Again, I'm just copy pasting to not bore, bore you guys. For a, for a first method, I'm again using data frame that plot for the insurance premium is my Y axis and kind is histogram, number of pins is 10. And also I don't want the whole uh, range. I only want the the amount of insurance premium from $800 to $1,200, which is my budget. And this is my histogram. You see it started from $800 to $1,200 and the frequency uh, and the number of pins. Or I could, instead of doing this, I could do it using dot hest, which in that case, I need to give it a specific column or series. So I just do DF that insurance premium that has, and then number of pins, and again, still range. 
and their final result is the same thing. Um, let's say you want to, instead of histogram, you want to get the CDF or cumulative density function. For, for the human density function, you could do the same exact thing that you did here with only one difference. You can add another uh, input, which is the cumulative equal to true. And I'm also removing the range because that might mess up the result. And then And see, I have the, all the values automatically printed. So th this was pandas. Uh, I'm going to show you a few examples for the matplotlib, just using matplotlib, and then also some uh, more gen, more more specific image processing techniques using matplotlib. But the the focus might be more, uh, on some other aspects, not necessarily matplotlib. So let's say I have, you have your image. You want to use matplotlib to um, read the image. All you need to do is to do plot that in read and then give the address to your figure. In this case, I have a figure subfolder and I have a, a bunch of like UA mascot. Let's say we want to import that. So I have the plot matplotlib imported and then plot that in read from this local directory. And then I have my image, which is a, a NumPy array. If I look at the type of image, is NumPy array. If I look at the shape, yeah, it's a color image, 500 by 313 pixels and so on. And now if I want to show this, in, because then we were working with vectors, which is why we use pl plots. When we are using for with 2D arrays, we use imshow instead. We just do plot that instead of plot, we do plot imshow and then image. <coughs> and we have UA mascot here. So now if you wanted to play with this, for example, if we didn't want to show this text, this X and Y axis, all we needed to add here was <coughs> simply do plot that, see it has a bunch of different features, in show, in save, so on, so on. We want to remove the axis here. So we do plot that axis off. And simply with this two line of code, see I have the same mascot without the axis. But now let's say you want to show the grids here. You want to, not only you want the axis, but you also want to have the grids here too. So in that case, you do again plot that grid <coughs> and then on. You could say that I only want to get the majors, major grids instead of minors. And for the axis, I only want the Y axis instead of doing both. You see, I get the Y axis only for the majors. And if, if you didn't have the axis, you should, should show for both. The default is both Y and X axis. The, the other thing that Panda was doing this uh, a little automatically, not quite, it was overlaying together, but let's say you have multiple images and you wanna show them side by side. Let's say you have an RGB or dull images and you want to show different channels, different colors, because each of them has different information that you're interested in. So th this is what I was saying that I'm using second image just to load some, some images. Uh, 
if you type secret image that data that retina, it will just give you an image of retina, which then if you show it, we could see this is This is the image. This is all why I need this image at this point. At the end, I'm using for a different thing, which is, uh, I guess, a little bit off, might be more advanced off topic here. Now, let's say instead of just showing the whole RGB, I want to show different channels similar to, or pandas similar to NumPy, I guess. Because the image is a NumPy, I can simply just extract different channels, uh, which is blue, green, and red. It, this should be something that you already familiar with. That's why I'm not going through. And then use that plot, that subplot. Uh, so let's separate our channels. I have red, green, and blue channels. Now I want to show this separately. I can do plot that subplot. And then I want, uh, I have three images or four images. I want to show them side by side. So I have a one by four uh, sort of figure. And then the index for the first one is one. So I do plot that subplot one for one, or you could do it with the comma two. It'll work either way. And then im show. Instead of directly doing plot that im show and then do red, you could do the CPA as grayscale instead of color. And then if you draw it, um, what I miss? Oh. Hold on. As you can see, this is the red channel. If we do this for all three channels, you see this is the same thing. I'm doing a subplot one for one. For the first one is the original image, then red, green, blue. And I'm only changing the last in this index, which is the first image, second, third, and fourth. Also, I'm adding the title and removing the axis. And, and we have three channels separate. So, if I, I don't know how, how many of you have your computer uh, right now with you, if uh, let's, uh, let's do a simple practice. So it's pretty simple just uh, for us to take a break. If you have secret image installed or if you have your own image, just get uh, read your image in, in, uh, in your Jupyter notebook and then try to uh, show it. Yeah, this is a very simple one, obviously. You can play anything else just to give us a five minute break, maybe so that uh, we could recuperate, I guess. Uh, Kelsey, is, is that okay to get a five minute break so that everyone can? Anyway, so. Uh, so uh, I'll just uh, go get, get some water and be back in by 4.16, so four minutes from now. About 20 minutes, I'll try to show you some very interesting image processing applications using uh, Matplotlib. It wouldn't have much more advanced, it just to show you how you can take advantage of these things that we learned. So for the first one, uh, it's how to suppress different color channels. And by suppress, I mean, let's uh, say you wanna plot your retina image, but you don't want to show the red channels or something like that. As I said, in NumPy array, which is like Panda, all you need to do is to use broadcasting again. You'll, you want to set your first channel, which is 
the blue here to zero, for example. And then if you show this image, you, you have suppressed that one, that, that specific channel. We only have uh, red and blue. And we can do this for all three channels. Again, I'm using subplot. Uh, the first one is original. I'm getting the red now from second image. The first or the second plot is the suppressed image for the first channel and then second channel and then third channel. And the, the other interesting thing that we could play with is tinting the image instead of uh, suppressing the channels. So in order, uh, uh, let me just show you from the function because I don't want to go through the details to not go over the objectives. So I have defined a function for tinting the image, which takes a NumPy array and a percentile, how much we want to tint the image. We normalize the image, get the shape, create an white image. We'll tint if, if you're not familiar with when someone wants to like, paint your house, your walls, they add white color to the original color that they have to make it more tinted. Yeah. And so you see, I'm adding my original image which is my bucket of color, let's say, whatever it is. And then take my white color bucket and then add it to the whole thing. And how I'm adding it is true by subtracting it from the original image and then multiply by the percentile. And the app was tinted image. For, for the input, I'm loading my own image, which is called paint.jpg. You can uh, load your own thing. I'm using plot.imread and then call this function. And I'm saying tinted for 40%. And then I'm showing the original image and the tinted one. See the left one is the original one and the right one is the tinted image. Uh, the other cool thing that we could do is to shade our image. The opposite of tinting, I guess. We want to make it look a little bit darker. In this case, similar everything except for a function, which for a function, uh, instead of adding a white uh, bucket, we just suppress the original intensity values for the original image for each color channel by the percentile. If, for example, we wanted to uh, shade it by 40% again, we just multiply the whole 3D array by 0.6. And because NumPy can do broadcasting, it'll automatically multiply each cell in that 3D array by 0.6. And then I have my we have my sh our shaded image. Um, now let's get a little bit more, I guess, creative. Let's say that instead of shading the whole thing, you want to gradually do the shading from left to right so that the, the righter you get, uh, the darker it gets. So for this, my function, again, I need to normalize it. I have a number of columns, which is image that shape one, which is my second dimension. And the way it works that I'm using NumPy that learn space. And I'm saying go from zero to one for all the number of columns to, so zero is 0%, one is 100%, which means that the most, the rightmost uh, column would be completely black and the leftmost would be completely white. 
which is my horizontal brush. If you've watched Bob Ross, when he does the brush to draw a cloud or something like that, the further he goes, the lighter it becomes because the color brush loses its color. This is the opposite of that. And this is a function in case I have a, a gray image, which in this case I don't, this is RGB. And then I'm using numpy.dstack to, uh, if, if it was a, a gray scale image, I'm stacking this horizontal brush in, in third dimension so that I have three different brushes for each of those dimensions, which in this case would be color. And then at the end, I'm just simply multiplying my brush to the image. But in case of Bob Ross, he has to go from left to right using his hand. In our case, because we're using computers, we could do it instantly or not instantly, but very, very extremely fast and apply to all the cells. For the image, instead, again, I'm reading my own image, which is called artist, and then calling the feeling artistic. You see, uh, the, the leftmost uh, is completely dark and the rightmost is uh, uh, completely white, or we can't really see it because we have to apply zero, it, it will lose all those colors and gradually uh, decreases the color. Uh, we already played with histogram with uh, uh, pandas, but Matplotlib also has histogram which just for the sake of you would develop multiple skills. Uh, I brought that one to here. So you would be familiar with both. And also with histogram, you can do a lot of cool things. If you are working image processing and general analysis, you could do uh, segment your data or modify the contrast and enhance your image or detect edges. Uh, it has, even though it's very simple, you know, technique, you can do a lot of interesting things with it. So in order to use a Matplotlib, similar to a plot, I guess, you just need to do plot.hes instead of plot.plot or plt.mshow. I'm getting the retina image again. I'm using subplot. First one would be the image and the second, uh, the box would be my histogram, which you can see, even though I'm using plot, I'm getting the output, but it still will automatically save that for me. And you see, I have the retina and I have the histogram, which for example, let's say you wanted to segment or separate the retina from the background. You see that we have a big uh, jump here, which is obviously the background, it's all the black dark values. And then you have a Gaussian light distribution, which is the actual retina. So if you take, get a threshold in between here, let's say 25, you could separate your retina from the background and you've done segmentation essentially. Uh, so let, let's do this uh, segmentation. This is called global threshold, uh, which you use one threshold for the whole image. My threshold here, I set to 150 in this case, because I only I'm working with one specific channel, I guess. I, I want to get the background of the oh. Let's do smaller than 25. Let's see what we get. I think it's because
So I, my treasure is 25. I want to get everything bigger than 25. So this would be my mask. And then this would be my image. And also I want to get the histogram too. In this Ravel, the Ravel only changed the 3D or 2D array into 1D so that we could use the plot hist. We could use plot hist two, which is for 2D, but uh, that's a slightly different. Let's see if that would work. Oh, I don't know why. Let's load the image again, I guess. Okay, this sounds good. So the image when I unravel, we see we have this time because it's not just one channel, it's all three channel. We see two separate things, but our threshold was 25, which means that we are getting uh, separating the uh, background, which is this dark area. And this white area is my, our, our retina, retina, what we're looking for. This, this was global thresholding. Uh, if you use second image, this is the one example that I mentioned that I'll show you guys. Second image can do these things automatically for you. It has a very nice function. It's called try all threshold. It has multiple different functions for thresholding, which is Otsu, uh, Isode, triangle, and all these different mathematical uh, techniques. But if you use that try all threshold, it applies that to all of these different techniques and show you the result. So, so let's, let's do that. Again, I'm getting the text image from second image and then run all the thresholding from second image into that. And these are all global thresholding. This we did here is called histogram thresholding, but Otsu and I, I'm not going through the details of those, but if you're interested, in it, there are some more advanced techniques. The, let's say this was my text and this is some ancient text that we want to uh, digitize. This is, for example, how Google would do it. A little more advanced, it wouldn't do global, but do local. In order to digitize, first need to, to get rid of the background and then identify what each of these values would stand for, which in this case, we see that like, Otsu did a good job, Triangle did a good job. Or instead of this, you could do it uh, one by one by simply, see I'm importing a threshold link from secure image that filter, you could do threshold link that threshold also and then image. The other thing that, the other interesting thing that we could do is to use OpenCV. This is another extra thing to it. Well, I, I figured just I can show you to show you a little bit more advanced uses on how it might not necessarily directly be in MapLolib, but just so that you can see how it would look like when you do different uh, cool tasks in Python use and try to visualize them using Matplotlib. By the way, this second image also uses Matplotlib as a dependency, but it does automatically, so we don't need to do anything there. Uh, we want to use uh, OpenCV to enhance our image contrast which in that case, again, I won't go through the theory, but the, the, the general uh, view is that we take the history group, we measure the cumulative sum, and from that cumulative sum, try to normalize the image. Essentially, we are trying to stretch the history group. And again, I'm using plot subplot and uh, disabling the axis and specifying the color. Which, and See, so this was my original image, and then my cumulative CDF and also Easter And this is just to show there are a few other steps to enhance, but I feel like there might be just 
unnecessarily complicated. So I won't, I skip those. There's also filtering. You could filter your images, again, using second image. Second image is for image processing. Different types of image called Sobel Curved Robbers, for example. Again, I'm taking the rocket image from second image. I convert it from RGB to gray, and then apply Sobel with all, all these different enhancement techniques, and then use Maplotlib to show it. Um, the last, I think it was the last thing or the one before last. This is for smoothing. Let's say you have a noisy image and you want to smooth it. Um, so for smoothing, one simple thing could be to apply a Gaussian filter. Again, from second image filters, I'm importing Gaussian. I'm getting the horse image from second image, apply Gaussian to it. Well, you could specify parameters too, but let's go with the default. And you can see this was the original one, which is a little bit noisy. I don't think you can see it though. And then the smooth version. I should have got it. Better image for this. Um, uh, just to show you a simple uh, open CV threshold technique, I guess, for again segmentation. Let's say you have the, a brick image, image of a bunch of bricks, which again I'm getting from second image. And we want to use open CV this time to threshold it and segment it essentially. For open CV, is CV2 that threshold, and then a you know, bunch of parameters which I won't go through and also using Otsu technique. This is just to show you different ways you could do the same things. And uh, you see it on the left, I have my original image and on the right, I have segmented all the bricks. Let's say you want to count these. Uh, if someone wanted to count this by uh, like manually, they had to go and label this one by one, but with one line of code, and then in, in, I guess, two, three lines of code, you can segment this and then count this, which counting is also as simply just almost as easy. Then there is a term in which processing called morphology, which is to play with your binary image, with your mask, which again, I'm using OpenCV for it. And there, called eroding or erosion and also dilation, implying the same brick image. So the eroded is dilated or eroded. The opening is erosion and then dilation, closing dilation, and then erosion. This might look a little cooler, I guess, for you guys, which uh, we want to, um, label each of those bricks with a different uh, color. Let's uh, say so instead of bricks, let's say there were animals or humans. You wanted each of them to be an, a unique individual. In that case, you could use OpenCV connected components with connectivity of four in this case, uh, which is I mean, up, down, left, right. If it was eight, it would be all, it would also have the, the 45 degree on each axis, uh, on each direction. And then this is, so this was my original mask. And then the output to the right is that each of those bricks has its own unique color, which is different than everything else's. Uh, and th th this was it. 
this was the end of <coughs> a few examples that I figured might be interesting to you guys to see how you can use Matplotlib and NumPy, which is very similar to one does to show these results. If uh, you guys have any question, please let me know. Um, so, Wahid, do you uh, do you know if there was any question in the chat that I might have missed? Uh, I didn't. I don't see any questions. Maybe. So I guess if there isn't any question, we yes can. So Kelsey, how does this work? Sorry, my computer just froze when I turned on my camera. Um, well, one question I have actually, and we were chatting about this earlier on in the workshop is I've never seen a Jupyter notebook run in, I think that's VS code. Yeah. And I looked up how to do it and I couldn't get it to work just you know on the side in five minutes trying it. Um, so I'm curious why you choose to run your Jupyter notebook there and just learn more about kind of your IDE decisions because that's something that a lot of new learners really struggle with. Uh, the, the reason that I use VS Code is because it makes programming a lot easier. When uh, you, you guys all see that every time I wanted to type something, I would just, uh, only you wouldn't see that I click the control the space and then it'll show me the options that I have. For example, PLT dot, and it'll show all the options that I have. Jupyter mm -hmm. Notebook, uh, at least uh, as far as I know, it doesn't, you can't do that. But with VS Code, you don't really need to do anything. Uh, all I do in order to be able to use Jupyter through VS Code is to just open it, and then yeah, it'll that's order. what I did. But it looked kind of like a JSON file instead of a like an actual notebook, and so I'm sure there was something about Anaconda that wasn't working. Well, it, it, it usually first is like that takes time, it, but it shouldn't take more than a few seconds, and it'll automatically should uh, prompt you to install some libraries, which after you do, then it should work. Uh, I'm not sure why cool. for you hadn't, but for me, usually- I always are... struggle with the Python IDEs. Every time, it's so frustrating. <laughs> That's one reason I'm more of an R user is just because I struggle so much with the IDEs in Python. Well, I've never gotten comfortable. I think that you can use R with VS Code too, by the way. I haven't, but I think you can. Yeah, and you can use Python in R Studio now, yeah. which is nice, but it's not the same as a full IDE built for Python. Yeah, that, that, that is true. They're, they're not specific to those. Yeah. Well, if anybody else has any comments on that as well, um, you can feel free to speak up or speak in the chat. But it sounds like the workshop's done. Um, thank you so much, Artin. This has been really great. I think Vahid recorded, and so he can stop the recording so we can get it saved and then uploaded. Um, I think we're uploading it on YouTube very shortly, so that's going to be great. And everyone say thank you to Artin for volunteering his time. And thank you. how do you want me to get the Jupyter Notebook if you want to? Um, if probably the quickest way is if you upload it to GitHub, you can put just a stable link to it on your HackMD. Oh, I already have that, so I can do that. Oh, yeah, that would be perfect. Um, we do have a question from Alma in the chat. I'm getting, I also get very confused with IDEs. Why do I need IDEs in Ubuntu? I think. The Ubuntu is talking about yesterday, Ken Ewens Clark taught Python testing and types um, and basically said he was using MyPy to test, like kind of like a linter, but a more complicated linter, and explained that it wouldn't work on Windows. You needed a Windows subsystem of Linux. Um, I don't know about that one, Alma. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I think I've used MyPy via VS Code in Windows too. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, it was something about the way he was launching it um, because Windows doesn't have full command line, but I thought that, I don't know. 
Well, the new, uh, maybe he doesn't have the latest version. Windows 10 actually now has a command line, which is very nice. It's very powerful. Okay. It's, not, it's not as same as Ubuntu, but yes, if you have the Ubuntu subsystem, it'll make your life much easier, but yeah. you don't have to. Yeah. Um, so there's the, your answer, Alma. You don't need to use Ubuntu to use Python. As long as it's added to your path on your computer, you can use it many different ways through command line, et cetera or Jupyter Notebook. And this VS Code also has an online version, which means that as long as you have internet access and a search engine uh, and a browser, you, you can use VS Code too. Oh, well, that's nice. Maybe I should try that. All right, well, thank you so much, Artin. Um, as I said, if anybody feel free to jump into chat just so it's not just us two and Alma, but um, tomorrow morning we have more workshops. Um, there's going to be one on prefect for pipelines for data in Python, I believe. Um, so if you're focusing on Python, that's a, going to be a great one for you all. Um, and on Friday, Artin is going to teach another workshop, correct? Yes, it's about machine learning life cycle management. It's going it would be, really be very great. different than this one. If you're interested in knowing how the final deployment of your software would work, that would be very interesting to you. Yeah, and right before that workshop, we're gonna have a workshop on scikit-learn, which is a one of the main machine learning packages for Python. So hopefully we will see all of you there. Um, and tomorrow night, starting at 4 p.m., we will have a hacky hour, which is a happy hour for all of us to get to know each other. So I um, hope to see you there as well. Thanks everyone. Bye everyone.